Hey everyone, the name's Eric Dorr, and in today's video, I am addressing the number one biggest misconception of the decade. I'm talking about Susan Cain's works on introverted people in her number one bestseller on the subject, Quiet. Introversion is more about how do you respond to stimulation, including social stimulation. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is wrong. So extroverts really crave large amounts of stimulation, whereas introverts feel that they're most alive and they're most switched on and they're most capable when they're in quieter, more low-key environments. When Susan Cain started using this definition of introvert, she put herself at odds against a large majority of the highly sensitive extroverted types. And not only that, she turned her back on the original definition of the term coined by Carl Jung. When I realized there was an inherited trait that's been studied under other names, such as shyness or introversion, but its basic characteristic is something else. For example, 30% of sensitive people are actually extroverts. Carl Jung coined the definition of introvert and extrovert, and his argument was that the introvert had an inwards-oriented energy, while the extrovert had an outwards-oriented energy. Beyond that, Carl Jung even coined the term a highly sensitive person, but he always treated it as something that was different from introvert. Then, Elaine Aron was the person to finally pick up and start researching the term highly sensitive people. And she did something great. She proved in many ways that introvert and highly sensitive person should be kept separate. Other people, however, like Susan Cain, Hans Eysenck and Jerome Kagan, instead started researching introversion outside of Carl Jung's original definitions under what appears to be highly sensitive people. Eysenck and Kagan were one of the few researchers that decided to research introversion as high arousability. They predicted that people who were more sensitive to stimuli were people who were also more introverted. But when this was proven false by Lynn Aaron, the discussion should have stopped. Yet it didn't. We're standing at this standstill today where introversion and stereotypes about introversion popularized by Susan Cain and other authors have become so predominant even though their basis in research is questionable. But now, don't get me wrong, I think that Susan Cain has done a great job of spreading understanding about what it is to be sensitive. She's helped a lot of people realize that there is nothing wrong with privacy. In fact, privacy can be essential to developing great theories, to coming up with new insights, to finding out new things about the world. What she missed, however, was that it was not just introverts who needed this, but also the highly sensitive extrovert. And that's why we need a shift in debate. We need to help the highly sensitive extroverts understand more about themselves. We need to extend that level of understanding not just to the introverted sensitive types, but also to the highly sensitive extroverted type. And here I'm speaking to a lot of the ENFPs out there, the people who talk quickly, who make connections quickly, who see patterns, who explore and love to investigate their surroundings, but also who need time to themselves, time to organize your thoughts, time to understand, time to unwind when the world becomes too overwhelming. And not just the ENFPs, I should say, ENTPs too, and possibly, probably ENFJs and ENTJs as well, to some extent. To understand you, we need to shift the debate from introverts being the quiet ones to the highly sensitive people being the quiet ones. And yes, there is a lot of support for this. Social psychologist Shalom S. H. Swartz found that people who value freedom highly also value privacy highly. That people who value creativity highly also need a lot of independence of mind, privacy to explore their thoughts, to make connections, to think before anyone can judge them for it. By letting people describe which values were most important to them, he found that people who valued the ability to move and make your own decisions in life highly were also the people who needed a lot of integrity and freedom of mind. 
The shift I'm proposing is that we start understanding that highly sensitive people are more connected to and more likely to be intuitive than they are to be introverted. The shift in debate I propose is that a lot of people out there are misdiagnosed introverts. They are not introverts. In fact, they are sensitive. And that's a different thing entirely. But I think that to understand and make sense of all of this, we need to really understand what introversion and extroversion is. And if introversion and extroversion has nothing to do with sensitivity, then introversion and extroversion has to do with something else. In my book, The Next Steps of neo Jungian Typology, the step that I'm proposing, the change I'm proposing, is that we go back to Carl Jung's original definitions of the concept. If we want to talk about what introversion and extroversion is, we should rest upon what Carl Jung thought, what he wanted the term to be about, not what it has become in modern day context. In one segment about extroversion, he said something so interesting, and that was that the extroverted type gets confidence from having objective proof for the decisions they make, that their decisions are based on objective reality. And I think that's so important, because I think that in so many ways, introversion and extroversion has so much to do with where we get power, where we get our confidence from, where we get that sense of clarification or that sense of certainty that helps us make good decisions. Truly, I believe that introversion and extroversion has so much to do with our mood and how we feel, and what gives us that sense of clarity that helps us make decisions. When I was researching the neuroscience of introversion and extroversion, I came upon a concept in neuroscience, so-called dopamine D2 receptors, so-called warning receptor. Neurobiology essentially found that some of us had more of these receptors than others, and that those with the most of these receptors were the most likely to respond critically to new information. And what I found myself thinking while I was reading about all of this was that what would happen if we ignored these warning signals. My hypothesis was this. If we ignore these warning signals, we will find ourselves becoming more anxious, more unstable, more frustrated, more prone to anger or to emotional outbursts, and more likely to feel negative or anxious or restless. Following all of this, I thought that introversion and extroversion essentially has more to do with how we stabilize our mood and what strategy we tend to employ to calm ourselves down in these times. True it is, it doesn't have anything to do with arousability, that's something else. When listening to my extroverted friends, I just become more and more aware of how theory, how memories, how insight and awareness you get from this introspective, inwards-oriented process usually has a tendency to unsettled extrovert. Beyond this, the extrovert tends to want this inwards process to be based on what was relevant for the situation. For the extrovert, the inwards-oriented approach, which they can use, they can use it as well, is only a means to use to when you can't use evidence from your environment. Instead of having this inwards-oriented process in its own, for its own sake, the extrovert uses the investigative process instead. The ENFP or the ENTP, regardless of how sensitive, enjoy making connections, seeing how things fit together, seeing how to combine different things, exploring new patterns, exploring new possibilities, seeing new information. And they do it because it gives them a state of center, it gives them a state of confidence, it gives them that sense of, yes, I'm certain, yes, I know what to do. Where often I think that the longer an ENFP or ENTP avoids this process, the more uncertain and the more shaken up they become. The highly sensitive extrovert, when comparing themselves to normal sensitive extroverts, will find that their glass fills up much more quickly than the normal sensitive extrovert. While the normal sensitive extrovert can keep on going and going and feeling like, oh, I need more, I don't feel good enough, I don't feel like it's enough, the, nor the highly sensitive extrovert feels like, oh, I'm good now. <laughs> and while the normal sensitive extrovert explores the spotlight and goes to the center of the room, the highly sensitive extrovert goes, hey, what's behind that door? 
Oh, what is that corner over there? Oh wait, where did that person go? And just like the description of the intuitive extrovert, the highly sensitive extrovert has no need for sensory thrills on their own. What they need is the possibility, they want the pattern, they want the connection, they want to spot what's under the rock, they want to find out what's hidden, they want to investigate the world's mysteries. And I believe this is so important because what happens if we have a group of intuitive extroverts who grow up thinking that they have no creativity or that they are less creative or less imaginative or less capable of intuitive original thought than the introvert. To be honest, I think that even Susan Cain is an ENFP. I don't think she's an INFP at all. And I think that she's one of the many people that prove that you don't have to be introverted to be original or creative. That the introverts aren't the only people that can be sensitive. And I think something needs to happen for us to gain an accurate and more meaningful understanding of what it really means to be sensitive, what it really means to be introverted, what it really means to be extroverted, what it really means to be a normal sensitive or non-sensitive person. And I find myself hoping that maybe my book can make a difference, or maybe my videos can make a difference, or maybe you can make a difference by making videos here on your own, by making writing articles on your own, by supporting and sharing articles by, for example, Elaine Aaron, by, for example, different Jungian theorists, by, for example, Carl Jung, so that we can help shift the debate, so that we can help understand these things better. Like I keep finding in my live streams and in all the messages that you're sending me, there are so many smart people out there, so many gifted people, so many talented people out there with so many rich perspectives. And if you have any thoughts about this subject, feel free to share them in the comments down below. Feel free to send me a message on YouTube. Because to be honest, interacting with all of you is one of the most fun and entertaining and educational things that... I Anyways, that's all for now. Thank you for watching this video and I hope to see you guys in the next one.